Hi, thanks for tuning in to our presentation on Sandworm, reading the indictment between the lines. I'm Robert Lipovsky, Senior Malware Researcher at ESET, and in my role I focus on threat research, whether it's research on advanced persistent threats or cybercrime or vulnerability research, and I've been doing this work at ESET for the past 14 years. Hi, my name is Anton Chiripanov. I'm a senior malware researcher in ESET. I analyze complex malware threats. So our talk today is going to be about Sandworm, one of the most dangerous APT groups out there, in our opinion. And specifically, we'll go into two attack campaigns for the past few years. You might know Sandworm from, from past hits like Back in Black Energy, which we presented for the very first time at Virus Bulletin 2014. That's seven years ago. So you can see that we've been tracking this group for a really long time, even before they gained fame, even beyond the cybersecurity industry, with the first ever malware-induced blackout, which we discussed at Virus Bulletin 2016. And then the, not the other blackout caused by Indestroyer, we talked about that at Virus Bulletin 2017. Now, in case you did not attend one of these presentations or you don't follow uh, Sandworm that well, just a very brief uh, recap of this, of this infamous group's activities. So uh, here's a rough timeline of what, what can be considered under the umbrella term Sandworm. Uh, we break it down into various different subgroups and we've been tracking them under these names before uh, the moniker Sandworm was more widely, uh, widely used. So first it was Black Energy, as it all revolved around the Black Energy malware. And as I said, Black Energy was used in a lot of attacks before uh, the infamous power grid attack, uh, which resulted in about a quarter million Ukraines being left without power, the first time that being a consequence of, of a hack. So that happened in December 2015. Then a year later, another blackout happened, this time by a uh, cyber weapon of a much higher caliber. Uh, we discovered Indestroyer, and that was the first ever malware specifically designed to attack power grids. And Black Energy then sort of evolved into two distinct subgroups. Um, Gray Energy, uh, it, it we considered to be the successor of Black Energy because it continued in attacks against uh, high-value targets, specifically critical network infrastructure and ICS systems and the energy companies in Ukraine and also in Poland. And then Telebots was more focusing on various other types of companies, mainly the financial sector, and their most prominent attack was the Nalpetya outbreak that, as we all know, spread well beyond the borders of Ukraine. And then there was also Olympic Destroyer in 2018. Now, without a doubt, the most exciting news about this group, which hit the news about a year ago, actually just, just a little while after VB2020 localhost, and that was the US Department of Justice indictment of six Russian GRU officials of, uh, for their alleged roles in the group's many attacks. Now, that of course is a very significant thing geopolitically. But the most important thing for defenders is that even though Sandworm's most infamous attacks dated between 2015, roughly until 2018, this dangerous group is still very much active until today. As illustrated by the first campaign that we'll be briefly mentioning today, um, in February this year, the French National Information Security Agency, ANSSI, released a report revealing an intrusion campaign targeting the Centrion IT monitoring software, which resulted in the breach of a number of French organizations. That campaign lasted from 2017 until 2020, and it affected mostly IT providers, especially web hosting providers. Two backdoors were discovered on compromised systems, the PAS web shell, and much more interestingly, the XRML backdoor. Now, to understand the significance of that, we first need to answer the question, what is this XRML? So back to our time timeline and division of Sandworm into subgroups. When we discovered Indestroyer, 
and that it was behind the second power grid attack in Ukraine. We thought this attack was done by Sandworm, but we had no proof. I mean, it was highly probable. But at the time, we didn't have hard concrete evidence to make that attribution, so we were very careful in our claims. And that evidence arrived in April 2018 with Exeromel. So Exeromel was a Sandworm backdoor, specifically part of the Telebots activity cluster, and it had actual code similarity with the main Indestroyer backdoor. Here you can see a comparison between the decompiled code, Exeromel on the left, and Indestroyer on the right. Now, in the contents of hacks like the one against SolarWinds, which was all over the news when the French report came out, and also if you consider that Sandworm, specifically the Telebot subgroup that has also been behind Xeramel, has carried out supply chain attacks in the past. The, most famously, the compromise of MEDOC, which led to the Nopetya outbreak, but that wasn't the only one. So the obvious question was, was Centrion a victim of a supply chain attack? And the answer is no. The attackers exploited installations of out-of-date versions of the Centrion IT monitoring software, not the company itself. Centrion was not distributing malicious code, kind of like the case of the Kaseya attack. Now, the fact that it was not a supply chain attack, of course, is a good thing, as finding otherwise would indicate a serious compromise with much more far-reaching consequences. But still, organizations have been using vulnerable versions of Sentry on IT monitoring software, and attackers have taken advantage of that in order to compromise them. So there are definitely lessons to be learned from this. Now, back to the indictment and on to the second attack campaign, which is actually the main topic of today's presentation. And for us, the really interesting part in the indictment is the point about the Georgian companies, the attacks against Georgian companies, media companies, and also government entities, which were not that widely covered, unlike many of the other attacks by the group. Specifically, some of the details are mentioned on page 41 of the actual indictment. And now I will let Anton walk you through these attacks against uh, Georgian companies and give you some more technical details. Anton? Thank you. We detected an attempt to deploy dropper of this malware using PowerShell Empire in 2019. Interesting that uh, the same CNC server that was used for this PowerShell, it was publicly mentioned by our colleagues from Kaspersky in 2018. So it was published before uh, our detection. And then and PowerShell is attempted to run a dropper. Uh, and dropper is an executable file signed using this code signing certificate issued to Ukrainian company named uh, Lady. Exactly the same code signing certificate was used to sign file coder Buran ransomware. It's a bit strange because this Buran ransomware is used by e-crime group and it has no connection to Sandworm. I guess a reasonable explanation here that they both bought the certificate from the same source. The dropper contains encrypted payload details for both architectures and IE's key for decryption. The dropper decrypts payload DLL, drops on the disk and re registers in Windows registry. And here, the most interesting part about this malware, it registers this dropper drop DLL as time provider. And legitimately time provider Time provider can be used to retrieve accurate timestamp from hardware and network. However, since it's a DLL which loaded by system process, it makes time provider good technique for persistence. This technique is not new. It's documented in Mitra 
attack framework. However, it's a rare technique and there are only few malware families that use it. Uh, the Windows Time service is responsible, responsible for loading time providers. The malware have to be sure that Windows Time service is running and start method is set to auto. If it's not set to auto, then malware won't survive the reboot. So there is a thread in malware that checks for start type in endless loop. Each dropper has encrypted configuration inside. It contains time for sleep between connecting to a CNC server and a list of CNC servers. Interesting thing here that sleeping time is set to a relatively long amount, seven days. It means that the malware will connect to CNC servers only once per seven days. Uh, CNC communication is using standard HTTP. The communication is encrypted using uh, IS keys. Request to CNC is encrypted with one IS key and ans answer is encrypted with second IS key. Each analyzed sample contains own hard-coded pair of such keys. And this makes payload very targeted because for re each sample, the attackers have to maintain encryption keys on server part. Here is a list of commands supported by malware. As you can see, it's a standard backdoor that is able to execute shell command, execute another bi binary supplied by attacker, update configuration and delete itself. There is no exfiltration or anything like that. There is a string in body of the malware that is not referred anywhere in the code. And it seems it represents version of the malware. And it, this version is 2.10. So it's possible that the other version of the, the same val malware in the wild. Uh, let's talk about detection. I think it's better to discuss detection uh, not just about this particular malware, but the whole persistent technique. Most of the tools, they don't support uh, enumeration of time provider DLLs. So the most effective method is just to query Windows registry key in order to see how many time providers are registered. But if you don't have access to a registry, you can check uh, event logs because in order to survive reboot, uh, malware has to change Windows time service and it has to change start type to auto. So it will be listed there. And the third method is according to documentation, time provider DLL must export these specific functions. You can see on the screen. We can use that. You, using your Yara rules, we can hunt for such binary files. Um, and But of course, this rule will detect legitimate files. But if you ch check this rule against fresh Windows installation, there are only two or three such legitimate files um, we can use uh, this method when we don't have access to registry, Windows registry or to, to event, we don't have access to event log. And for example, uh, we can use it to detect time provider DLLs in unusual file path. Robert. Thank you, Anton. So let's wrap up. Sandworm is one of the most dangerous APT groups and also an ongoing threat. And it's also the basis of the newest upcoming round of the MITRE attack evaluations of EDR solutions. If you want to know the story and hear details about how we investigate Sandworm, I do encourage you to read Andy Greenberg's book on the group. And now to recap the main points of our talk. First, 
The time provider persistence mechanism is really interesting and also quite unique and very rarely used in malware, so something to keep in mind in your hunting. Back to our presentation title, so what does it mean reading the indictment between the lines? What did the indictment reveal for us? Well, we knew about the campaign and similarly to in Destroyer and Xeramel, we, suspect, we suspected that the attacks against the Georgian media outlets were done by Sandworm, but again, we were not sure. We did not have hard evidence. And after reading these, these, these indictments, after reading that the attacks were attributed by, uh, to the group, Anton looked at the telemetry again. And the CNC infrastructure and code similarities allow us to make this attribution with high confidence. And lastly, this serves as a really good example that it's really important to focus on prevention and detect threats in their early stages, not just to rely on EDR solutions and react to an attack as it happens or even in worst case scenarios after it had happened. In this case, since we detected the initial stage, the sleeper implant, it appears we were able to save at least this one media company from a massive data loss. So we will continue tracking Sandworm and maybe talk to you at, and hopefully meet you in person at another Virus Bulletin event. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask us through Twitter.